Good evening. I'm Professor Jenny Richards, Joseph Cowan Professor of English Literature. Welcome to tonight's Insights Virtual Lecture titled Shakespeare as a Sound Artist by Bruce Smith, Levy Hume Visiting Professor. I'll be back after the lecture for a live Q&A with the speaker. If you'd like to submit a question, you may do so via the YouTube live chat box on your screen or via Twitter at Insights NCL. If you're tweeting about the event and want to share your thoughts, please use hash Insights NCL. Now for my introduction to our speaker. Professor Smith is Dean Professor of English and Professor of English and Theatre at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles. Aside from being one of the most generous scholars I've had the pleasure of meeting, he's also one of the leading Shakespeare scholars of our time with many books to his name. From Homosexual Desire in Shakespeare's England in 19, 1991, to Shakespeare Cut, Rethinking Cutwork in an Age of Distraction in 2016, the latter was based on his 2014 Oxford Wells Shakespeare lect lectures. And as I'm sure you can imagine, there are many more titles in between these two. But the award-winning book for which he is undoubtedly and rightly most famous dates from 1999. It is called The Acoustic World of Early Modern England, Attending to the O Factor. It was the first attempt to think seriously about the, about the apparently impossible task of recovering the soundscapes of earlier cultures. And it also marked a recognition that sound is of itself meaningful in usually silent literary studies. This book has been influential on my work. And I think about it as the book that keeps on giving no matter how many times I read it. Indeed, it has undoubtedly given us the lecture we are going to hear this evening. And it is also the reason why Professor Smith will be with us at Newcastle University from April the 1st this year for two semesters, one this year, the other next year, to work with students and staff, literary scholars, musicologists, artists, many other disciplines, and our performance network. And finally, I'd like to thank the Levy Hume Trust who are funding his Newcastle visit. I hope you enjoy his lecture. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I want to uh, begin by thanking uh, Professor Richards for that wonderful introduction. Thank you. I also want to thank for technical support, uh, Umbarin Moyer. And I want to welcome you. Um, I wish we were all in the same room together so that uh, I could have a show of hands to find out how many of you have actually seen sound art. Um, but I want us to establish some common ground here at the beginning. <clears throat> so I'm going to play a short snippet uh, from a gallery video of a sound art piece by Susan Phillips. <clears throat> who is a sound artist I have really uh, come to enjoy very much and that, whose work I value. Uh, she was born in Glasgow. <clears throat> she won the Turner Prize in 2010 for a sound installation that was in Glasgow <clears throat> underneath the bridge, bridges over the River Clyde. And it uh, broadcast ambient sound of uh, amateur voices singing uh, uh, singing songs associated with the lowlands of Scotland. Uh, before we look at this together, we'll look for a couple of minutes to get our, 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 our uh, bearings. Uh, I'd like for you to pay particular attention to sound and space, because sound and space are the two things that I'm going to bring to bear on Shakespeare's plays to see how sound art can prime us for coming to Shakespeare with new ears. So um, I'm gonna share the screen here and uh, <clears throat> we'll uh, listen to this and uh, come back and talk about it.
sound, space. Sound art is uh, an invention, is usually taken to be an invention <clears throat> of the 1960s uh, by an international uh, cooperative community of avant-garde artists who were known as Flexus, F-L-E-X-U-S. And their idea really in all of the media that they dealt with was to make art strange. And strange is a word that's going to crop up in my presentation, especially at the end. So if you found this strange, you're on the right wavelength already. Um, keeping uh, what we looked at and listened to in mind, I want to isolate what I think are the salient qualities of sound art. And then we're going to take those qualities and apply them to four Shakespeare plays. So sound art calls attention to sound as sound. It's inviting us to listen to sound in and of itself and not through sound toward some other semantic meaning. Two, sound art foregrounds the sources of sound. In film, they talk about diegetic versus non-diegetic sound. And uh, non-diegetic sounds are sounds that you can't actually see uh, in the visual image, sounds that are coming from the background. That's never the case in sound art. Even in the Lowlands in installation in Glasgow, <clears throat> you could see the speakers underneath the bridge. And in this case, there is a dislocation of the actual singing voices, but those sculpted speakers that you walk around and among uh, in that uh, gallery video are very much what the art is about. There are frequent attempts in sound art <clears throat> to turn sound into something that can be apprehended with other senses. Okay, number three, sound art exploits the location of sound. It sounds a particular location. Uh, this particular gallery video really gives you a sense of that. You're immersed in sound inside this gallery uh, and the enclosure of the gallery and its various rooms, they're more than what we saw here. Uh, <clears throat> are really played out by the fact in this gallery video, you, there was a view where you could see traffic outside <clears throat> and uh, it, it points at the enclosure of these particular places. So space, it's sound, but it's sound in a particular place. Okay. Uh, the fourth thing is that sound invites interaction. Listeners, are not supposed to be passive. They're invited to be part of the sound experience. And if you were able to go to this gallery, you would be able to plot your own course around, through, by, and above the various, uh, the various speakers. The camera tries to do that for us here. And finally, sound art is open to contingency serendipity and the unexpected. That means that it's that different and means to be different for everyone who experiences it. So applying this to Shakespeare, there might seem every reason why Shakespeare was in a different category altogether. But I wanna point out four things. One is that Shakespeare was a designer of sound events. And those sound events are, were cued in the form of the scripts that we read and that we hear in, uh, in dramatic productions of Shakespeare today. So sound events. Um, another point is that voice, speech is a feature of these sound events, but it's not the only feature of those sound events. When we go to a performance and we hear 
music, either live as part of the production, or most often we hear it through speakers that are not seen, uh, that take over from film, the idea of there being this kind of ambient uh, atmospheric sound. Um, <clears throat> Shakespeare, those, 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 those events, those sound producing events are there on the stage. They're there in the form of musical instruments. They are there in terms of the producers of the sound, the actors. They're there in terms of throats, in terms of mouths, in terms of chests that breathe in air in order to produce, to produce speech. Um, also involved in Susan Phillips' sound art is putting across a narrative. Uh, the, the Lowlands uh, video, and you can find that pretty easily uh, online, uh, is about the place of Scotland as a point of departure of people who were forced to leave Scotland and go to other places. So in this, this piece of sound art that we, that, we, that we heard and saw, there is also an implicit narrative that this is about finding calm, depth, quiet, in a sleep-like state that is very different from the busy world that we live in, the world that could be seen through that open door in the gallery. <clears throat> And finally, uh, her sound art is very much about a specific space. Um, Shakespeare's plays were also about a very specific place. And I've got just one more image to show you. Uh, and that is this uh, view of the Globe Theater. This is a detail of one of those large engraved views of London. And you can see here how the Globe Theater was a cylinder. And that cylinder was like the gallery space for Susan Phillips's uh, sound art piece in that the sound event was designed to fill that entire space. And that cylinder is equivalent to the rectangular uh, cube-like rooms of the, uh, of the gallery. Okay. Give me a moment here to flip through my notes. So I'd like to uh, just do a kind of census of the sounds that we would hear uh, in a Shakespeare production. And really maybe think about that in terms of the globe because there is no, there was no electronic sound. Everything was produced by people operating in that space. So this is in kind of chronological order. The first thing you would hear at, a, at going to a production at the globe was noise. The noise of the audience, uh, people finding their seats, people jostling in the pit to get the best to get the best standpoint. Then you would hear blasts from uh, trumpets. Uh, these blasts were done, we think, from the roof of the globe, and uh, they were intended to let people on the outside who might be arriving late to know that the performance was about to start, but they were also a signal to this busy, noisy audience to quiet down and get ready for the performance. The next thing we would be likely to hear would be a loud, dominant male voice. That could be a prologue, it could be a chorus, it could be a male authority figure, like a king. Not all of Shakespeare's plays begin that way. Othello, King Lear, they begin with conversations in progress as if the art, the sound art, is, a, is, is, a, is, is coming out of the noise, but with most other playwrights in Shakespeare's time, it's very much a sound event that is signaled by a dominant male voice. Then in the course of the play, there will be a mixture of dialogue, of people talking to each other, two, three, four uh, people, usually no more than four. There will be 
people turning to talk to the audience in asides. There will almost always be some form of instrumental music or instrumental sound. In the history plays, <clears throat> that would be predominantly drums and trumpets. But in other plays and comedies, we're going to be looking at As You Like It in a moment, it would be singing. It would be different musical sounds produced by a gallery of musicians who were in plain sight in the Globe Theater. Um, the last thing is likely to be another dominant male voice, but that gives way to noise. So this beginning in noise and this ending in noise, uh, I think invites us to think about it, not the sound, not as something linear, but as something circular. Maybe noise up here at the beginning, and then as the play progresses, we pass through various other kinds of sound, but we return to the noise of the audience, to applause, to boos, to jeers, to shouts at the end. And I like that circular idea because the shape of sound is a sphere. It's a circle. So in a performance, it's that sound, that sphere of sound that is being activated within the cylinder uh, of the globe. Okay. I think that uh, the linearity of scripts, you know, reading a printed script in a book, reading it online, really gives the idea of moving from here to there to there, and then we reach the end, the beginning, the middle, and the end. And in taking the lessons of sound art and applying to them to Shakespeare, I'm inviting us to consider the totality of sound and to a sense that the sounds are always potential and they're always present. Okay, so um, I want to turn to four Shakespeare plays and uh, just challenge you to think about them in terms of sound and to think about the ways in which these plays can be analyzed in sound art in terms of sound art. Okay, so uh, the first one that I'd like to look at is Richard III. And I mentioned uh, drums and trumpets. So Richard III is full of drums and trumpets. <clears throat> so a good example is in Act 4, Scene 4, when Richard has come to power and uh, the Duchess of York and Queen Elizabeth have come to complain to him about uh, the violence that he's done, the murders that he's committed to get where he is. Um, <clears throat> and their speeches, if you read the play, their speeches are very long and clearly very loud. So Richard uh, says, a flourish, trumpet, strike, alarum, drums, let not the heavens hear these tell-tale women rail on the Lord's anointed, namely me. Uh, in Act 5, the tables are turned and Richmond is preparing to, is preparing to do battle with Richard. Uh, and there's a scene where he rouses his soldiers. And again, it's a very long, soundful speech. Uh, and at the end, working them up for battle, he uh, says, this is the last two lines, sound drums and trumpets boldly and cheerfully. God and St. George, Richmond and victory. It's hard to believe that there wouldn't be a big audience noise after this rousing speech. Thomas Haywood was a playwright who uh, wrote a book called the, An Apology for Actors that was published in 1612. That is uh, an, an attempt to point out all of the great things that plays do. And he met one of the things that he mentions, this is to counteract criticism of, of public theater. So one of the things that he does <clears throat> is to talk about episodes like this one where Richmond 
is about to overturn Richard III. And he says, what English blood seeing the person of any bold Englishman presented and doth not hug his frame and honey at his valor, pursuing him in his enterprise with his best wishes, which to me indicates that the audience might be yelling their support for Richmond as he goes off to battle. So uh, giving him, supporting his enterprise with his best wishes and as being wrapped in contemplation offers to him in his heart all, pro all prosperous performance as if the actor playing Richmond were Richmond himself. Okay, let me pause for some water here. And let's talk about As You Like It. So the fictional location of, of As You Like It after the first few scenes is the Forest of Arden. And the Forest of Arden is a certain kind of acoustic space as well as imaginative space. So the Arden as an imaginative space is capacious enough that lots of different episodes can be happening within the forest, but without their actually being in communication with each other. And the same thing is true with all of the variety of sounds, the voices in As You Like It, they run the gamut from the courtiers to Audrey, William, and Corin, the country bumpkins who live there, Silvius and Phoebe, who talk as if they had walked in from a pastoral poem, uh, full of different kinds of voices. It is also full of music. So I don't know if my, I'm going to be heard here by Catherine Roberts Parker, I hope so. She is currently a fellow in the Institute, the International Center for Music Studies at Newcastle. And I was privileged to read her dissertation where she brings musicological skills to bear on uh, comedies, Shakespeare's comedies. So she has outlined the variety of kinds of musics that are happening in the Forest of Arden and showing how these different musics uh, lead to the, out, the, the, the outcome of the play. So uh, there are Under the Greenwood Tree, which she traces to be a dancing song that everyone in Duke Senior's uh, uh, court can, uh, in exile, can participate with. There are also snippets of popular ballads, uh, one of those being Blow, Blow, Thou Winter Wind. Uh, she also points out that there are catches, rounds that have a different that have their own existence outside the play in social singing, and uh, she takes that to be the song "What Shall He Have That Kill the Deer." There's also the most familiar music, probably uh, in "As You Like It," an art song. Uh, it was a lover and his lass. Uh, <clears throat> she traces the origins of that uh, to art music, which would be something that one would hear in the court and sees that as a kind of opening up toward the court at the end of the play. And then finally, very interestingly, she thinks about uh, Hyman's song at the end, Wedding is Great Juno's Crown, uh, looking at other settings of this kind of music, that it, that it, that it involves <clears throat> the harmonies of church music. So a variety of music uh, in As You Like It. Uh, and I like the, the sense that in As You Like It, it the Forest of Arden is being a kind of uh, place with lots of locales. We can have something of the wandering through uh, that I've talked about as being serendipity and the unexpected in sound art. Okay, I'm turning now to Hamlet. Uh, there are lots of reasons that you would think that this is anything but sound art. Uh, it's a play, uh, a long play, full of words, 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 as Hamlet says to Polonius when Polonius asks him what he is reading. Not only that, it's a wordy play, but not only that, <clears throat> uh, it's a play 
whose fame and the role in particular has attracted all kinds of actors, famous actors. Where does your Hamlet come from? Is it come from your reading? Do you hear it in your head? Or do you think about a production you've seen with a notable actor playing the main role? So what I wanna point out in terms of sound art are two things about Hamlet. One of them is the dislocation of voices, which forces you to hear sound as sound. The ghost, the ghost refuses to talk to Horatio, Bernardo, and Marcellus, but will talk to Hamlet. So Hamlet, that puts Hamlet in a place of dislocation vis-a-vis -vis all the other voices in the play. And that really is pointed up in the scene where Hamlet tries to explain to Horatio and Marcellus what the ghost has told him. And in that scene, there are cues for the ghost's voice, not his body, but his voice to be heard from under the stage, moving under the stage and saying, swear, swear, swear. So you understand what I'm saying about a dislocation of voice, a dislocation of sound. There's another kind of uh, making sound strange in the play that we might miss if we just think about the famous actors that we may have heard uh, playing the role. Uh, in Shakespeare's time, character was understood to be a function of body chemistry, four major body fluids, and your temperament or your, your, your kind of psychological state could be changed according to which of those fluids <clears throat> was dominant. And in the case of melancholics like Hamlet, that would be black bile. So lots of writers in the period talk about the peculiar voice quality of a melancholic. And they all agree that because melancholia is cold and dry, people who have those voices are not forceful speakers. They stammer, they stumble. If they're male, the pitch of their voice has been described by these writers as womanish and their voices are also not loud, but soft. One explanation that comes from Aristotle's rhetoric uh, that Juan Huarte uh, applies to uh, melancholic characters is that their imaginations are so active, but their vocal apparatus is so cold that they can never get out as fast as their imagination is presenting. So in thinking about the sound quality of Hamlet, uh, I, I hear, based on what these writers say, uh, a making strange of Hamlet's voice, uh, not a celebration of his oratory. Okay, finally, I'm gonna to turn to The Tempest. So in some ways, this is Shakespeare's most sound artful play. It begins with disorienting noise, the tempestuous noise of lightning and thunder heard. And heard makes the listener the primary focus. Uh, it makes the listener the center as the listener is the center in, um, in sound art. Um, the fictional world of, of Prospero's Island is, according to Caliban, teeming with all kinds of unscripted noises. They're only described and occasionally they're cued, the sounds in the play, but they're not a matter of words. So Caliban, at near the beginning of the play, actually uh, talks to the audience and talks about how Prospero uh, torments him with strange sounds and strange animals. For every trifle are they set upon me, sometimes like apes that mow and chatter and after bite me. Later in the play, when he is trying to woo Stefano and Trinculo to help him murder Prospero, uh, he tries to tell them that the island is not the savage place that they've made it out to be. The isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. 
Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that if I then had waked after long sleep will make me sleep again. So Caliban's own voice runs the gamut from this lyric rhapsody to curses, to cries. Um, and even there's one moment where I hear something like Black African speech, the punctuation of the chant that he, that he falls into when he's so happy that Stefano and Trinculo are going to have him murder Prospero, the apostrophes suggest a syncopated rhythm. Ban, ban, cacala, ban, get a new master, have a, have a new man. Um, there were Black people around in London, and Shakespeare's audience could have heard them. And maybe this voice is another voice that is in the, in the play. So with respect to boundedness, there is fictionally the constriction of the island. There's also the cylinder of the performance place at the Globe uh, or the, the rectangular box at the Blackfriars where theater, indoor Blackfriars theater where this may have had its first, um, its first performance, but it ends in an invitation, either place, an invitation to the noise with which the play began. And that comes in the form of Prospero's epilogue in which he says, um, but release me from my bands. I'm gonna be trapped here if you don't help me. But release me from my bands with the help of your good hands, gentle breath of yours, my sails must fill gentle breath of yours, bravos, not boos and hisses, uh, must fail or else my project fails, which was to please. Okay, I want to finish with uh, giving some acknowledgement to contemporary sound artists who take Shakespeare's uh, sounded speeches and turn them into contemporary art. You could say that every performance of a Shakespeare play is a kind of sound art. But there are other sound artists who take bits, the sound as sound, and turn it into art. So one of those is uh, James Bully, who contributed to an exhibition held at the Royal Shakespeare Theater in Stratford in 2016, where he took two recorded sounds and fused them together and gave the, uh, the viewer listener a uh, visual focal point. So the two recorded sounds were uh, Paul Robeson speaking Hamlet's, uh, excuse me, Paul Robeson speaking Othello's final speech before he commits suicide. And that was from an electromagnetic tape recording uh, that I presumably became uh, a, a, a record, a, record, not a vinyl record. I'm not sure what they were making in 1940, uh, but 1944, but that's when the speech comes from. So Robeson speaking that speech, and then a musical composition from 1909 called Othello Suite uh, that was written by a composer named Samuel Kohler, Coleridge Taylor. So those two things were fused. And then the visual element was a reminder of the source of sound, the recordedness of sound in the form of a uh, player piano roll that instead of having the, 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 the punctures that flicked the hammers on a player piano, uh, had uh, Arabic gum uh, indicators that gave visual presence to uh, Robeson's speech. In other words, it recorded the rhythm of Robeson's speech so that you could hear it, but you could also visualize it. And that is a way of making sound strange. So I hope my talk tonight has encouraged you 
to make sounds strange in your encounters with Shakespeare. I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. very much for, for an absolutely fascinating lecture. I've already got lots of questions in my head, but I can see that questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, so I, I think, believe we have about 10 minutes for question. I'm keeping an eye on the time. Uh, the first question comes from Sally and she asks, are there common themes between Shakespeare soundscapes or are all soundscapes unique? I would say that one thing I left out of the lecture, I had to leave out of the lecture for time, were <clears throat> uh, Queen Elizabeth's country progresses in the, in the 1590s, she would go visit uh, noblemen <clears throat> on their country estates and they would transform the landscape of these country houses uh, into fantastic soundscapes with music, uh, speech making, little dramas, all kinds of things. So there was the idea of, of taking, uh, taking, uh, taking a particular place and creating a soundscape. So I would say two things, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I would say two things uh, about the question. And one is that uh, the Globe Theater uh, created certain physical circumstances that were favorable to certain kinds of soundscapes. Uh, the Globe Theater at being a cylinder, the sound did not bounce from the top. There was no ceiling for it to bounce down, but it was a broad side to side sound. So uh, we need to keep that in mind in thinking about Shakespeare's soundscapes. But my own feeling is that Shakespeare's soundscapes are very much a function of the genre of the play that's, that, he, that he is writing. So that's why I wanted to pick a history play a comedy, a tragedy, and one of the late romances. So I hope that answers that very good question. Just to comment on that, I really like Sally's question because what you're saying is that the, the space shapes the kind of um, sound and how it's used. I, I thought that was a very good question as well. But we've got another question, another excellent question. This one is from Katie and she asks, is there a key difference between sound art created with intention and accidental sound art? Well, I hoped to emphasize the fact that there is always an accidental uh, element, that, that sound art leaves open the possibility uh, that, that the, the, the interaction of the listener, the viewer, is going to be different for every person. But I do think that, that, that people like uh, Brandon LaBelle, who is a major writer on uh, sound art and like Susan Phillips uh, based in Berlin, uh, who also creates sound art, his sound art is much more uh, open to chance and to uh, wind, to whoever happens to be passing by in an urban landscape in Lowlands, Susan Phillips, 
uh, is not does not allow for the voices of the people that are passing under the bridges along a, a kind of key along the edge of the river. Um, so I think Brendan LaBelle would say that I have left out something very important about sound art. And indeed, he and I were both speaking at a at a, at a conference at, at Harvard a few years ago, uh, and we had a little conversation. And I happen to know that he thought that treating Shakespeare as a sound artist uh, was not really legitimate in his eyes because it's too planned. Yes, it's open. Every performance is different, uh, and all of these elements are there. But some sound artists are much more invested in chance. A lot would depend, wouldn't it, on improvisation and the responses of the audience that would, that's the accidental sound out, I guess? Uh, yeah, and I was trying to really, I mean, no, no two performances, I'm sure anybody who has been to see the same production twice can attest that uh, each performance is different and it's the audience reaction uh, and how present the audience seems and whether there's throat clearing or uh, are whatever sounds are coming from the audience uh, do make for that difference from one performance to another. I'm thinking about a production many years ago of the Royal Shakespeare Company doing uh, Much Ado About Nothing and Beatrice's Kill Claudio produced a gasp one night and it produced laughter another night. No, that, that could happen. So. But I do have a question for you, um, Bruce, as well. I mean, in um, I really like this idea of um, the plays as sound art, but that's not normally how we think of plays. So we either think of them flat on the page to be read and studied, and we tend to do that, or we have conceived of that in the past as silent activity, or we get up and perform them. And when we do that, sound isn't necessarily what we might foreground. There'd be movement, there'd be tactility, there'd be, so you're privileging one sense, this visual as well. So I just wondered about how um, your colleagues in uh, theatre history, how they, how they might respond to thinking of the plays as sound art, and also about the kind of things that you've been talking about and the artists that you've been working with, how that experience which is being foregrounded is so important might be shared with um, audiences who have I don't know hearing impairments or who you know might hear differently uh, it's two parts to that question wow okay I can say that uh, I'm not totally alone in this uh, in my interest in <clears throat> privileging sound I mean I I, I uh, uh, I have to say that my own decision to become a, a Shakespeare professor and to study Shakespeare uh, in graduate school came from hearing and seeing productions at the Royal Shakespeare Company when I was a student for a year at the University of Birmingham. And the Hamlet that I saw, that was a long time ago, it was 1966, 67. And there was a Hamlet on uh, with David Warner playing Hamlet and he had this quiet, whispery kind of voice. And so the reviews of that production were very hostile, uh, but he, it was, you know, he was a person of his time. He was an angry young man and young, and there were a lot of reasons for that. But anyway, my own personal investment is, is, is that uh, I am very attracted to music and to the sound quality of actors, uh, actors' voices. And I want to encourage uh, others to pay attention to voice quality, to rhythm, to, to not just listen for a semantic meeting. I think everybody does that already, but it may not be a very conscious, a very conscious thing. Um, so I'm not the only one. The person who comes to mind is William West at Northwestern University, who just has a new book out uh, that really explores uh, the multiple qualities uh, of sound. And he's going to be giving a talk uh, next month, uh, a lecture, uh, an endowed lecture uh, at Loyola University in Chicago that is going to try to move beyond semantic language to, uh, to take into account whispers, 
and cries, phatic cries. So it's kind of pushing the boundary of what counts as sound. So your question about, uh, about hearing impaired people is, is also very important to me. Uh, for many years, I taught at uh, Georgetown University in Washington, DC. And it so happens that there is a, a university Gallaudet in Washington that was founded in the 19th century specifically for hearing impaired people. So many productions uh, of, of, of plays at the Folger Shakespeare Library, there would be certain nights when there would be an interpreter for hearing impaired people. And indeed, one could go to a symphony concert at the Kennedy Center, and on certain nights, there would be uh, an interpreter of the music for hearing impaired people. And I, uh, in, 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 uh, at the, when I was at the University of Southern California, I actually got in touch with a, a, a hearing impaired interpreter. This person was not hearing impaired, but he had grown up with parents who were hearing impaired. And he specialized in translating music and poetry and drama into American Sign Language. And he, uh, I talked to him about his craft and he explained it. And it all had to do not with, 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 uh, not with translating word for word for word and doing the finger symbols, but creating a sense of space in which a gesture toward this speaker or to that speaker or to me, the interpreter, or to you as the hearing impaired listener, uh, he created a dramatic space with his hands. So that would be my answer. I think that it's entirely possible. And I think that there uh, is a, a whole aesthetic experience that hearing impaired people uh, uh, can have that we cannot have. One of the students in a, a, a class that I was teaching this past semester on poetry across media uh, said, cited the case of uh, someone uh, who was a young person, 18 to 20, I guess, who had an operation that, that restored or gave that person hearing and their experience of popular music was impoverished, they felt by being able to hear as we hear because they had felt a connection to the vibrations in their bodies when they went to concerts and they, they couldn't feel that because the sensorium had shifted. So, yeah, so I think there, you know, it's a whole thing that we don't, those of us who can hear, uh, I, I, you know, we don't imaginatively encompass the fact that something could be better than hearing. Thank you, Bruce. That's a topic I'd love to pick up with you again, hear more about. We have two more questions. I think these will, might be our last questions this evening. And uh, again, uh, I can't wait to hear what you have to say to them. The first one is from James and he asks, is there a place or space that you particularly enjoy for its sound? Uh, a space for performance? A any space for sound, anywhere that you particularly, where you particularly enjoy the experience of sound, thinking about sound, find sound meaningful? I mean, I guess well, the we one that immediately comes to mind. I was lucky enough to be uh, uh, to have a uh, residency at uh, Boliasco, south of Genoa, and really, this 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 villa uh, is primarily uh, it is primarily residences for artists, uh, you know, for dancers, visual artists. But there were two academic stiffs when I was there among the ten people, and we took a. Uh, we took a trip to, uh, to a place that you had to, actually had to go to by boat. Uh, uh, and it was a, a, a Romanesque, uh, a Romanesque uh, abbey that was right on the seashore. Um, and when we went in, these musical people started singing and the entire, this domed Romanesque space, I mean, it really wafted one into uh, another realm. So I'd have to say that that highly resonant space uh, is probably the place where I really felt totally involved. Um, 
most theaters uh, and con and certainly concert halls have been designed precisely, you know, to make the sound present to you as a listener, but not to really call attention to the space, the acoustic attention to the space as a space. Thank you. That's a great question, James. When you come to Newcastle, Bruce, we'll have to take you to the Sage in Gateshead, which is a very special um, musical venue. That's uh, the sound is really remarkable. Is this uh, the the new hall? Yes, it is. Yeah, I've read about that. Yeah, we'll be taking you there. Right, I look forward to that. Thanks, and, thanks everyone for coming. I, yeah. I really, I really, I followed the some of the chat comments, and uh, I really appreciate those appreciated those as well. They were lovely to read, yes. Got one last question though, we're not letting you go just yet. And this one is from Keith and he asks, given the virtual world we've been living in for the past two years, can you comment on the difference between hearing and interpreting digital sound online, online and hearing sound in a physical space? Oh, thank you. Mm. Thanks very much for that. Um, I think that we have been uh, increasingly, not even before the pandemic, we've been habituated to uh, to digitalize sound. Um, and when I have taught sound studies classes at the University of Southern California, I, I mean, their students sign up for this because it, it's a new idea to them that sound could be something else other than what they're hearing through uh, earbuds. Uh, so that has become the dominant mode for younger people uh, as opposed to live performance. So uh, I can say that uh, I'm, I'm uh, on fellowship leave and I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico that has a very uh, <clears throat> wonderful art season uh, in the summer with a world-class chamber music festival. But there are also string quartet concerts uh, by, by famous groups. There was the Castellian uh, String Quartet from London who were absolutely fabulous a couple of weeks ago. And I have to say that once the pandemic had eased up here and I went to a live performance, I wept because there was a presence and complexity to the sound that I had really forgotten by being locked up for two years. Well, we can't wait to see you in person and hear you in person as well. <laughs> So, um, so thank you very much for a really wonderful um, lecture. Thank you. This is all we've got time for at the moment. This is all we've got time to. So just a huge thank you to you, Bruce. And I'm just going to put my hands together and clap on behalf of everybody. I'd like to thank um, our audience for watching and joining us. You've already thanked them, Bruce. Um, our, and, and then just say about what's going to happen next before we um, say goodbye. Our next event will be on Monday, the 14th of March, to mark British Science Week, the joy of science by Professor Jim Al-Khalili will be the um, uh, presentation. And we hope you will join us next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.